In cooperation with the Sword of the Lord, Beacon Video is excited to present the 1992 National Sword of the Lord Conference. The Gospel Light Baptist Church of Walkertown, North Carolina was the host for a gathering of God's people from across America. Soul winning and revival was the theme of this outstanding meeting. Listen now as Dr. Curtis Hudson, editor of the Sword of the Lord, introduces our speaker. Dr. R.B. Willett is pastor of the First Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Michigan. Been there 17 years. They've had a high day of 3,864. And last year baptized 746 converts. In February of this year, they moved to a new 2,000-seat auditorium. I've been with them several times, but not since they had the new auditorium. Scheduled to be there sometime in the near future. And uh, here's a man's winning souls to Christ up in a northern city and uh, building a great church. The Lord's building the church to the work there. And uh, I met him first over in uh, Michigan. I'm trying to think of the name of the city. Montague, kind of a difficult name. He's in a, sm a small church over there with him in a conference. Met him then. We've had him the last three or four or five years at the Sword Conferences. He's always a blessing and a challenge. We're delighted to have him here, Dr. R.B. Willett. Open your Bibles, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter 20. Matthew, the 20th chapter, we'll read verses 1 through 16. I'm privileged and honored to be able to be here. I like the things that the sword of the Lord emphasizes. And I like the fact they've been emphasizing them ever since the paper started and have never changed. Soul winning, baptizing converts, building churches, standing for the faith. You say, don't you get irritated? And Dr. Hudson writes some of those letters or, or editorials and tries to point out where somebody's doing wrong. No, not if it helps us stay right. I like that. Uh, I'm encouraged by that. The Bible says we're supposed to earnestly contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. And if it's worth anything, it's worth fighting for it. Our church gladly supports the sword of the Lord and its mission's budget. I hope you'll do that. And I like their emphasis on the local church. They're not trying to start a bunch of organizations that are para-church organizations. They're trying to build the church and help the church. I, uh, I got something from James Dobson's Focus on the Family magazine. Don't leave yet. Someone had asked him what were some ways that they could help to save the family. Let me read you what he said. Number one, work to help the homeless in your community. Number two, form a community action group to fight pornography. Number three, raise money at a bake sale to donate pro-family books to your local library. Number four, take advantage of the opportunities that may be available in your local public school district to review textbooks that are being considered for adoption. Number five, register to vote and encourage others to do the same. Number six, join a citizen's community action group that governs cable television. Number seven, volunteer your time with an AIDS support group. Number eight, teach a Sunday school class. He made it to the local church, the eighth thing on his list. On social action issues affecting Christians. He had three or four other things. You know what? You can take all that stuff and ignore it as far as I'm concerned. What you need to do is win people to Jesus Christ and teach them to live by the Bible, and you'll do a whole lot more to save the family than with all that stuff put together. And I like the emphasis of the sword of the Lord. I like Dr. Hudson. I love to talk to him. I love to learn from him. He's one of the smartest men I know, and I appreciate him sharing wisdom with us in these conferences, and sometimes he's done it with me individually. He's been a great, great help. I love him. I pray for him every day. When I heard that he was sick, and I'm so encouraged at how God is healing him, uh, I began to think what, what would happen if we didn't have Dr. Hudson. I thought, I'm going to try to think of three people I'd be satisfied to see take over the sword of the Lord. I got to zero, and I couldn't get any farther. I'm glad he's there. I think he's God's man for that job. And I appreciate him. And I appreciate this great church. What a wonderful group of people. I loved hearing Dr. Robertson preach last night. I love the message. And I love the man and the spirit that came through in the message. And what a great place. You know, it's so wonderful to see God bless in a place uh, where the man's not mean. He's not unkind. He's not a big shot. He doesn't have a, an attitude of arrogance or superiority. Just a humble, sweet servant of God and tremendous church. And this church's hospitality is well known, hosting this conference, having hosted the Southwide Fellowship, having hosted the National Bus Conference. Understand that the Republican Convention will be meeting here in a short time. <laughs> and uh, they'd be better off here than wherever else they go on. 
but I'm glad to be here and honored by the privilege. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1, the Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that is in householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out about the sixth the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, second time you find that little phrase, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the, first, uh, the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise received every man a penny. And when they'd received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Father in heaven, I pray you'd help me tonight. I pray your Holy Spirit would empower me, would direct me, would control me, that I would say just what you want me to say. Please call to my mind things that need to be said, that would help, that would encourage, that would meet the needs of somebody here. Please help me to skip over and eliminate anything that wouldn't honor you. I pray your name would be uplifted. I pray we wouldn't leave thinking that we heard good sermons tonight or heard good preachers. But I pray we'd leave thinking what a great God we have and what a great obligation we have to serve him and love him and give our best for him. So we'll lift up your name. I pray Jesus Christ to be high and lifted up and draw men unto himself tonight. Bind Satan and his powers and don't let them snatch away the seed as it's sown into our hearts. May we be good ground to receive the seed and bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And we'll thank you for it and give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. I notice several things in this parable. In the first place, I noticed the enlistment. The Bible says there was a man who was in householder, and he went out early. He was eager to get somebody to work for him. And when he went to the marketplace, and the most uh, uh, analogous thing we'd have in our society to that would probably be the union hall where people would gather, hoping somebody would hire them for the day. He found some people wanting to work, and he agreed to pay them a penny a day. He offered them a fair wage. A penny was a good wage for a working man in Bible times. It was one denarius. It was an adequate, honest, just compensation. And I want to say to you tonight that God pays good wages to his workers. I am so tired of testimonies that tell how much we gave up for Jesus. I could have been a millionaire, but I'm serving Jesus humbly over here. Wasn't God lucky when he got me? I could have been a rock and roll singer, but I gave up all the drugs and all the immorality and all of the suicide that goes with that industry and all of the filth and the garbage to serve Jesus. Aren't I a wonderful person to make a sacrifice like that? I could have been a professional athlete, but I gave that up and I served Jesus Christ instead. And we sing the song, and this is a good song, but this verse is bad. So send I you to labor unrewarded to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown, to bear rebuke, to suffer scorn and scoffing. When I was in college, I worked at a little church one summer who was going to sing that song for a special. The pastor had asked me to sing, and I picked it out. When he heard me practice, he said, don't sing that song. I said, well, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Why don't you want me to sing it? He said, listen to the words of that first verse. And then he looked at me, and he said, God doesn't ask anybody to serve him like that. 
No, God pays good wages. He doesn't ask you to serve unpaid, unloved, unsought, unknown. He always loves you. He always takes care of you. He always pays you. God pays fair wages. And I'd like to declare with joy and gratitude tonight that God has been better to me than the devil ever was and the devil ever could have been. He saved me. He separated me from the world. He sanctified me to his service. And he sent me out into his vineyard. I gave him my old tattered garments. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy tonight. God pays good wages. He went early. He offered a fair wage. And then he sent them out into his vineyard. He said when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Verse 2. He wanted them producing something uh, from his harvest field. As soon as he hired them, he said, I want you to get out there into the vineyard. We want to do everything but that these days in some fundamental churches. I talk to my preacher friends and I say, how's it going? And they say, well, it's just wonderful. We're rewriting our entire Sunday school curriculum. I'm not against that. But what you doing in the vineyard? I say, how's the ministry going? They say, oh, tremendous. Our Christian school enrollment is up 7.3%. Well, I'm glad it's up. But what you been doing out in the vineyard? Well, they say we're raising money to blacktop our parking lot. I'm for blacktop parking lots. I'm glad this one's blacktop in this kind of rain. But what have you been doing out in the vineyard? Oh, they say our per capita giving is up 3.7%. But what you been doing in the vineyard? We've been rewriting our constitution and bylaws. Some of them ought to be rewritten. But what have you been doing in the vineyard? Well, I've been studying how to preach expository sermons so that I can bore my people academically instead of boring them with the other sermons I've been preaching. Well, preach, but when you preach, what you want to see happen is God change somebody's lives and more people get out in the vineyard. Jesus said, the householder in this parable, hey, I've hired you. Now get out and get to work. Well, they say we have a new discipleship program. Did you ever study how Jesus trained his disciples? It might have been a good idea for some of these rascals that have been writing this stuff that has two people sitting in a room looking at each other once a week for a year and telling nobody about Jesus to study the Bible first. He didn't give them a bunch of notebooks and say, fill in all these blanks and then you can go tell somebody about me. You know, some of the time, Jesus took the disciples apart and taught them things. Most of the time, Jesus had the disciples with him while he was preaching the gospel and healing the sick and raising the dead and ministering to people. And some of the time, he sent them out by themselves, two by two, to preach the gospel. And I'd like to tell you, the best discipleship program in all the world is not the Navigators 2-7, and it's not the Source of Light Gospel Missions, and it's not any of this other stuff. The best discipleship program in the world is win somebody to Christ and Take them soul winning with you. Well, they say you put them out there before they're ready. I read in the book of Acts that Paul was in Thessalonica three Sabbath days. Three Sabbath days. He might have been there almost four weeks. He couldn't have been there any more than that. He might only have been there just three weeks and a day. And after three Sabbath days, Paul had right back, been to three Sabbath days, the church is established. He writes back to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8, and he says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Oh, Paul, don't let him do that. They're not trained yet. You've only been there three Sabbath days. They hadn't even heard the gospel before, Paul. They might mess it up. They might tell somebody something wrong. They might get something confused. But he said, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only to them in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad so that I need not to say anything. Boy, Paul got those people to hear about Jesus, and they got saved, and he sent them out into the vineyard. And that's where we're supposed to be. The master enlists us to go to the vineyard and win some souls for Jesus Christ. Amen. He went out early. He offered a fair wage. He sent him into his vineyard. He went back for more at 9 o'clock. He went back for more at 12 o'clock. 
He went back for more at 3 o'clock. He went back for more at 5 o'clock. And this parable shows us the great heart of God to get laborers out into the vineyard. I read in the Bible that God says, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I read that he says, I must work. Jesus says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. I read that he says, Go and teach all nations in Matthew. And go and preach the gospel to every creature in Mark. I read that he says, The harvest truly is plenteous. What's that do to these birds that say you can't win people to Christ in 20th century America? The day of building great churches is past, and the day of revival is past, and the day of confrontational soul winning is past, and we live in such a pagan society that people are not going to understand when you go and talk to them about Jesus Christ. May I remind you that conversion is not an intellectual experience. It is a spiritual experience, and the Spirit of God speaks through you to that person and woos them and wins them and convicts them of sin and tells them they need Him, and it doesn't matter how smart you are and how smart they are. You are just a messenger. You go tell them, and the Spirit of God does the saving work. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. The trouble with the average Baptist church is not mainly its order of service, though some of them might do well to be changed. The trouble with the average independent fundamental church is not the organization of its business, though sometimes it could be more scriptural. The trouble is not in most places the stewardship campaign. The trouble in most places is not the facilities or the location. The trouble is not usually the kind of programs that have been in place. The trouble is that there are not enough laborers going out into the vineyard. I read somebody had written a little allegory about modern fundamental Christianity. He said that in this allegory, he said, my brother's an emergency medical technician, and I was visiting him, and his beeper went off. And he said, let's hurry because this fellow's near us, and we can get there and stabilize him, and then when the ambulance comes, that will have done some of the preliminary things, and they can help the man. So they sped over to where the man was, and the, the brother started taking the pulse of the man and trying to help him. And soon enough, uh, real soon, sure enough, here came an ambulance up. And while the one who was the EMT stayed in and tried to help the poor sick man, the other guy ran out and said, come on, he's in here. But he watched in amazement as people got out of the ambulance, they began to get out speakers and microphones and soundboards. And he said he watched a long-haired fellow with a Jesus Saves t-shirt start to set that stuff up. And he said, hey, the guy's in here, come on, help him. And the fellow said, chill out, homeboy, we're going to help the guy, but we're going to do it by preparing his soul with some happening tunes first. Just then a second ambulance came up. And they began to pass out little brochures that told when they were on the radio. They had a table with tapes of the radio broadcasts and books, and he ran out and he said, hey, come on, the guy's inside. You can come here and help him. And they said, oh, we want to help him. We're very concerned. As a matter of fact, we have a complimentary copy of our latest book out to give to him. And then another group of people came, well-dressed, nice people, looked like fundamental Christians, and they stood together in the yard and began to sing songs. And then took out their notebooks and began to take extensive notes as a Bible teacher began to explain some things from the Scripture. And the guy who had been there with his brother, the EMT, ran out and said, hey, he's inside. I'm glad you've come. He needs help. These other folks aren't helping him. Come on in and help him, please. And he said, oh, no, no. Our job is just to be an example. Every sick person needs some well person to look to for an example, don't you think? Besides, the guy's bloody and we'd probably get messy and we'd just stay out here and be an example. Another group came up in an ambulance and they began to carry boxes of food in the house. And he said, come on in here, the guy's sick, help him, please. And they said, man is not a one-dimensional creature. You can't deal with a man's soul until his basic need for food has first been met. Another ambulance came. Boy, some really well-dressed fellas got out of there. And they began to take a collection from the crowd that had gathered around. With tears in their eyes, they made an impassioned plea. And the guy thought, well, good, somebody's finally trying to do something to help the guy. And they went in the house with the money and said, oh, that's wonderful. They're going to give him the money, get him the medical attention that he needs. And instead, they asked the family if they'd give the offering too. And clutching the offering plates close to their chest, they ran out in their ambulance and took off. 
The sixth ambulance was the strangest of all. For a man got out, began handing out pieces of paper to everybody. Just want to make sure everybody got one of these copies of papers that he had. And the fellow who had been there with his brother, the EMT, looked at it. And he found that here was a letter explaining in detail all the alleged unethical practices of all the other ambulance drivers. He said, hey, but there's a sick man in here. And he said, I'm going to take care of him too. And he stuffed a letter in the mailbox and he shook his finger and says, now you can't say I haven't warned you and drove off. Finally, an old dilapidated ambulance came up and a couple of dear ladies got out and ran in the house and began to give medical attention to the man who was sick. But he said in this allegory, just then my brother's beeper went off again and I thought, oh no. With those ladies there, who's going to help that sick guy on the other side of town? There's peace and contentment in the Father's house today. Lots of food on the table and no one's turned away. There's singing and laughter as the hours pass by. But a hush stops the singing as the Father sadly cries, My house is full, but my fields are empty. Who will go and work for me today? It seems like all my children want to sit around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. Well, oh, they say it doesn't work today. I was out so many six weeks or seven weeks ago today. I was going to see a man who'd visited our church, and while I was driving, I saw a couple sitting out on their porch, a young man and his wife. And I felt impressed to stop. I pulled the car. I walked up. Never seen him before in my life. Never been to their house. And I told him who I was. And I said, let me ask you a question. If you died today, do you know for sure whether or not you go to heaven? He said, no, I don't. She said, no, I don't. And opened my New Testament and showed him the gospel. Both of them bowed their head and prayed to receive Christ as Savior, Oscar and Tracy Daniels. And they came the next Sunday. And Oscar got baptized. And they came the next Sunday. And they came the next Sunday. And Tracy got baptized. And it's now been six Sundays. And they have come every single Sunday since I stopped by unexpecting to be, not expecting to be there myself, unexpected by them. You know what? You can win people to Christ, but you can't do it sitting in your office criticizing those who do. And when I got done, the lady looked at me and she said, you know, I've been hoping somebody would come by and talk to me about church. The enlistment. Went out early. Offered a fair wage. He sent him to work in his vineyard. He went back for more, but then notice, secondly, the exclamation. About the eleventh hour, verse 6, he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? What a good question for fundamental Baptists in 1992. What are you doing? Man, it's 5 o'clock. Some people have been out there since 6 o'clock. Some have been out since 9 o'clock. Some have been out since noontime. Some have been out for two hours at least since 3 o'clock. Why stand ye all the day idle? And I think Jesus looks at his church today, and I think he says there are lost people to be reached. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are converts to be baptized. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are classes to be taught. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are teenagers to be loved and challenged. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are bus routes to be built. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are friends and relatives to be won and reached. Why stand ye all the day idle? There are drug addicts to be delivered and gang members to be rescued and drunkards to be reclaimed. There are souls to be snatched as brands from the burning. Why stand we idle all the day? God help us. When I was in college, I was driving from Greenville, South Carolina to Gastonia, North Carolina to work at a church in the weekend. I picked up a hitchhiker. I began to witness to him, and he rejected the gospel, told me he was a Jehovah's Witness. And since he wouldn't listen to the gospel, I began to ask him about his beliefs. And I said, tell me about your congregation. Not a church, they call it that, maybe, but... He said, well, we have about 100 people that come. And he said, of those 100 people, 20 of them are full-time. I said, you got 100 people attending and 20 of them are full-time? He said, yes, that's right. I thought, man, these people must have some money. I, I, I don't want to copy their doctrine, but I might be interested in some of their stewardship lessons. And I said, how do 80 people pay the salaries of 20 people? He said, oh, they don't get paid anything. 
No, he said to be full-time just means that you've committed yourself to spend 40 hours a week knocking on doors and spreading the heresy and the ungodly beliefs and practices of the false cult called Jehovah's Witnesses, and you couldn't get the average Baptist deacon to spend four hours a week knocking on doors, and there's a bunch of preachers in this room hadn't spent four hours in any week knocking on doors in the last six months. What's the matter with us? We have the only answer, and we sit still, and Jesus says, why stand you all the day idle? I like sword conferences because they motivate me not to stand around idle. We got here the other day, and as we were going to our room, we saw a maid, and I tried to witness to her. I said, ma'am, if you died right now, do you know for sure whether or not you'd go to heaven? She said, I do now. A man on the fourth floor just showed me how. <laughs> I talked to another maid this afternoon. I'm in room 224, and, and she was putting some towels in there. I said, ma'am, if you died right now, do you know for sure whether or not you'd go to heaven? She said, the man in 214 just prayed with me. I had to talk to three maids, one construction worker, and two maintenance men before I could find anybody that wasn't saved and lead them to Christ. You might just get the idea, I hope you do, that if God could use Bobby Robertson to build a church of 2,800 with an attendance last Sunday of 3,466 in a town of 1300 then maybe if you wouldn't stand idle all the day god do something through you where you are and if god could use shelton smith in maryland a town of 18,000, and god could use brother ferris up here to have 1700 baptisms in his church last year you say yeah but a lot of those were kids you know who the idiots who say that are people who only baptize kids they're the ones those dead churches you know those GRB type, IFCA type churches? I know what I'm talking about. I grew up in those kind of churches. A few years back, the GRB was delighted and elated that they had had 10,000 baptisms in their association. Almost said denomination. Shame on me. But there are 1,000 GRB churches. That's an average of 10 baptisms a year in each church. And that's not a blessing. That's a disgrace. You know who they baptize? I came from churches like that. They baptize the kids of their members once they're 12 and have been through a six-week course. And that's all. You say, well, those are all kids. I don't care if they're all retarded four-year-olds. It still amazes me you could find 1,700 of them to bring them in and baptize them. Maybe you could baptize 200 if you could baptize 1,700. David Janney could go down to Orlando, Florida, take a church of 120 people and already sign papers to sell their auditorium and somehow get that worked out and get the auditorium back and in less than four years have attendances running six and seven and 800. Maybe you could win somebody to Christ and add something to your church attendance where you are. Why stand you idle all the day? We live in a kind of a tough town. When I moved to Saginaw, I had the highest per capita crime rate of any city in America for violent crime. More crimes per person than Detroit, Los Angeles, Chicago. Our buses have been shot. Our bus workers have been shot at. About a year ago, some gang members came in with guns in their car and came into our Sunday school to try to drag out some rival gang members and fight them. <coughs> but God doesn't have any trouble saving folks like that. God just had trouble getting people to tell folks like that about Jesus. One of our bus workers from Kentucky, he still talks like he's from Kentucky, looks like he's from Kentucky. And don't get mad at me, I'm from South Carolina. I'm not talking about the South, I'm just talking about Kentucky. <laughs> Which was a border state in the Civil War, but I can't find a Yankee there now. And he got a burden for the parents of the inner city children that we reach on our buses. Had a bus route for years. Had big days of war, 500 on his bus route. And we, we always said, well, these parents, you know, we can win them to Christ, but they don't have much character, and we're not able to do much with them, and they'd come for a Sunday or two, and they'd leave, and they'd come for a Sunday or two. But he got burdened about it. 
And he began to work with them and develop a class for them and, and try to do some special things to reach them and run vans to pick them up so they wouldn't have to ride the buses crowded with all the kids. He began to see some tremendous things happen. Some of them got saved and they came to the class and they started to tithe and some of them who'd been living together without the benefit of a marriage license got convicted and said, man, we need to get married. He's out visiting a lady that had come to his class pretty regular, been saved, and a couple of others that I think either he had visited them before or they had visited his class, a couple of men there. They're sitting around the table. Each of them had a big glass of beer. And he walked in the, class, in the, in the room, looked at the lady who was from his class, and he said, Is this your beer? She said, No, sir, Mr. Mitchell, that's not my beer. And there was a man sitting there, and he called his name, and he said, Is this your beer? And he said, No, it's not my beer. And there was the other man sitting at the table and said, Is this your beer? He said, No, it's not my beer. He said, let me get this straight. This is not your beer. Uh-uh. And it's not your beer. Nope. And it's not your beer. Nope. He said, well, this must be the devil's beer. They said, yeah, this is the devil's beer. <laughs> he said to his soul winning partner, Jerry Freeze, he said, Jerry, why don't you take the devil's beer and pour it down the drain? <laughs> so Jerry took the devil's beer. It's all the devil's beer. And he poured it down the drain. And one of the fellas Looked up, he said, Mr. Mitchell, if that's the devil's beer, them two quarts in the refrigerator must be the devil's too. You might as well throw them away. We're not having a problem with our methods. We're having a problem with our motivation. We're not having a problem knowing the techniques to use. We're having a problem getting people to be out in the vineyard and do the job and mark it down anytime anybody says you can't win people to Christ in this day and age. It is proof positive they haven't been trying. Notice. Let me, let me say this. Some of you have been here before and you tried, you went back, and it went wild, well for a while, and then it fizzled, and you want a bunch of people to Christ, but some of them didn't stick, most of them didn't stick, maybe none of them stick, and you gave it up. And you said there must be some better way, and some of us, God help us, have had no better sense than to try it out to California and let some heretic doesn't even believe in the blood of Jesus Christ try to tell us how to build some kind of a church. I don't read books by John MacArthur and Chuck Swindoll and all of those other fellows. They're not doing what I want to do. They're not doing what I think are Bible methods of reaching people, and I don't want to have what they got, so I'm not following what they suggest. But you say, I tried, and I tried, and I tried. We've been through dry spells in our church. We've been through times. We've been four years between 8 and 900. We'd get 12 above 900, and we'd go back to 876, and then we'd go back to 915, and then we'd go back to 870. And for four years, well, I know our economy was bad, and people were moving away, and, and it was easy to let yourself get discouraged. You say, what'd you do? What? I don't know. We just kept on doing what we'd always been doing. Amen. And then one day, we never did hit 1,000. We went from 900 to 1,100. And been growing ever since. And if we get stuck again, we just keep on doing what we've been doing because it's in the Bible. Amen. But don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Don't leave the Bible just because it doesn't come harvest time as soon as you think it should. Amen. Years ago, Charles Darby left Williamston, Pennsylvania with his pick and his shovel and went out to California to join those who were in the gold rush trying to find their fortune. He found gold, some gold. In fact, he did so well that he wound up getting a crew of men working for him and big machines and mining equipment. And they found some more gold, but then it ran out and they dug further and there wasn't anything else and they dug further and there wasn't anything else and they said, that's it, let's quit. He sold the claim and the equipment to a junk dealer. And he said, I'm going to keep what money I got left and not lose any more of it and go back home. But the junk dealer hired a mining expert and he said, I, I think there might be some more. And they dug three feet further and found the richest deposit of gold that there had been in that entire mine, that entire claim. Charles Darby had a nephew who was also named Charles Darby. And he learned from that experience, and he went to the city of Chicago, and in 1930 became one of only 50 men in the United States to have sold $1 million, this is 1930 now, $1 million of life insurance in a single year, made himself fabulously wealthy. And if you ask Charles Darby, what's the lesson that you learned from being with your uncle? He would have said this, I decided I'll never stop digging three feet from gold. 
And I say to you tonight, you may be discouraged and things may not be going as well as you'd like them to, but don't stop digging three feet from gold. Don't stop spreading the gospel. Don't stop preaching the word of God. Don't stop running the buses. Don't stop trying to build the Sunday school. Don't stop praying for your people and praying for the power of God and pouring yourself into your sermons. Don't stop digging. You may just be three feet from gold. But thirdly, notice the expectation. I almost didn't preach these next two points. But I think God wants me to. <coughs> the Bible says that when all these laborers came back, the householder had them paid from those who had worked the least first and then those who had worked longer. And when those people came who had worked one hour, they didn't get a twelfth of a penny, though they'd worked a twelfth of the working day in Bible times. They got a whole penny. And those folks who'd worked 12 hours started figuring it out. Oh, man, did you see that? They just worked an hour and they got a penny. Woo! Oh, man, 12 pennies. We worked 12 hours. He's paying a penny an hour. He must have misunderstood him. He didn't say a penny a day. He said a penny an hour. Good night. I'm going to work again for two weeks. This is wonderful. Man, wait till I get my 12 pennies. And they went to get their pay, and they got a penny also. Verse 10 says, when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. They expected something they didn't get. A lot of people have become discouraged and quit the work of God because they supposed God would do something he didn't do. You suppose by your 10th anniversary, the church would surely realize how bad you were and buy you a Lincoln Town Car. The only Lincoln you saw is on a $5 bill that a widow lady put in your birthday card. You suppose that after you'd been there three years, surely you'd be running 1,000, baptizing 500, seeing a budget of about $10,000 a week and preaching at sword conferences. You suppose that when you left here and began to give the gospel to people, the first dozen people who heard the gospel would fall on their knees with tears pouring out of their eyes and ask God to save them, would walk, walk down the aisle the next Sunday, get baptized, join the church, and start tithing. And it didn't work out that way. And notice that their expectation was without foundation. They had no reason to believe that they'd be paid more than a penny a day. They'd been told exactly what they'd get paid. Their expectations made them ungrateful, unappreciative for what had been given to them. Their expectations made them complain. Their expectations made them jealous. For they said in verse 12, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden, the heat of the day. You know what you ought to suppose? You ought to suppose that God is a good God, and if you serve him with all your heart, it'll be all right, and whatever he does will be just fine with you. You know, I noticed something interesting, too. These folks who worked for nine hours and six hours and three hours and one hour were very wise not to negotiate. You see, the master said, I'll just pay you whatever's right. Supposing they got in, they said, okay, we'll work an hour, but we want to be sure you're going to pay us one twelfth a penny. We won't work unless you pay us a twelfth a penny. We know that's a fair wage for an hour's work. Or suppose they said, we're working a half a day. We want a half a penny. We won't do it. No, if they'd negotiated and the Lord had agreed to that, they would have lost. My pastor said to me, uh, uh, if you don't have a good church that has a four-bedroom parsonage, I'd be interested. I'm not making that up. Hell actually said that to me. If I knew of a good church that had a four-bedroom pa parsonage, I'd recommend him a good pastor, not him. So I said, I'd like a, a church. It doesn't matter to me exactly how big it is, but I'd like a nice building and everything all paid off. That's all I want. <laughs> I've been here 17 years, we haven't paid off the hymn books. <laughs> Got 100,000 miles of them, had their engines overhauled, and we're still pay making payments every month. Psalm 62 and verse 5 says, My soul, wait thou only on God, for my expectation is from Him. Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26 says, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none on earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. God, I'm not going to negotiate about the benefits. You pay fair wages. You just decide what to give me. I'll take everything that comes as from a father's hand. 
then notice finally the explanation of this parable. Now, I know there's some things I could have said. I think maybe the parable teaches that those who serve God in the latter parts of the kingdom of God, closer to the return of Christ, though their efforts have not had time to multiply through the centuries, as did those of Paul and the early apostles, will still have equal opportunity for rewards of the judgment seat. I understand that. But let me tell you the main point of this parable. The householder answered, verse 13, and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. God's never done me wrong. God's never done you wrong. Amen. Only reason you think God did wrong is because you're not right with Him. Amen. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way. I'll give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Jesus is Lord. He can do anything He wants to do. Our God sitteth in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He pleased. It's all right. You understand it? No, but it's all right. I didn't understand it when my wife got cancer. I came out of chapel one day with a guest speaker. My secretary is waiting for me. She said, you need to go in your office first before you take these fellows to lunch. My wife stood there. She'd had a mole removed. We didn't think there'd be any trouble. The doctor said it was a malignant melanoma. I did not know them, but I've learned since it's one of the fastest acting forms of cancer can kill you in three to six months. And she told me. And I held her. And I said, we've been married ten years. If that's all I get, I'm still the luckiest fellow in the whole world. And I said, I'll get somebody else to take these guys to lunch. She said, no, you go ahead. I'm going to go home. I dropped them off at the restaurant and turned the car around the parking lot, looked over the Saginaw River, saw raindrops falling and hitting the river. And it wasn't easy to say, and I didn't feel like saying it, but it was right to say it. And I said, dear God, I love you. If you want to take my wife, it's all right. I'll still serve you. Amen. Oh, God spared my wife. The cancer hadn't spread, and we were so grateful. And that was almost 10 years ago. I didn't understand it, but it's all right. I didn't understand when after 10 years of marriage and us never making any effort to adopt children and never having had children, God miraculously opened the door for a little girl to come into our homes. And then the birth father contested the adoption. And everything that we learned about other similar decisions indicated that we'd lose. And I one time got on my knees behind a little curtain in my office and said, God, I never complained when you didn't give me children. I never said that you weren't fair. But God, why would you give me a little girl now? I've had her five months and then take her out of my house. And I said, I'm sorry. It's all right. You're Lord. I'm yours. You can do with me whatever you want to do. It's all right. I don't know who he is, but I read something by a man named Bob Moorhead. He called it my commitment as a Christian. He said, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the power of the Holy Spirit. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living, sight walking, small planning, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, top, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I live by faith. I lean on His presence. I walk by His patience. I'm uplifted by prayer, and I labor by His power. My face is set. My gate is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. My companions are few. But my guide is reliable and my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured, turned back, deluded or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, he'll have no problem recognizing me. My title will be clear. What do you say? Jesus is Lord. I'm his. He can do anything he wants to with me, and it's all right. 
I don't have any right to complain. I don't have any right to feel sorry for myself. I don't have any right to get discouraged and give up and quit. I don't have any right to sit around in the office and feel so bad because things haven't gone so well when I should be out telling people the gospel of Jesus Christ. My job is to get off of my blessed assurance and go out in the harvest field and labor in the vineyard for the master. He'll take care of me. 1890, Louisa Stead and her husband and their daughter, Lily, left their home in New York and went out to the ocean to have a picnic. Or a day at the beach may not have been the ocean. Mr. Stead and Lily went down to build some sandcastles. And Mrs. Stead went back to get the little picnic lunch set out. And while Lily and her daddy were making sandcastles, they heard some cries out in the water and they noticed a teenage boy was out there drowning. Mr. Stead did what any decent man would try to do. He went out on the water to try to rescue the boy. But if you haven't been trained in life-saving techniques, you may not be aware that the instinct of a drowning person is to grab on to whoever comes out to help them. And often a double drowning occurs, and that's what happened in this case. Lily and Mrs. Stead went back to their little house, and Mrs. Stead worked diligently to try to scratch by a living for herself and her daughter. No government programs in those days. One day they got to the place where they didn't have anything to eat. Didn't know how they're going to make it. And Mrs. Stead said, Lily, we're going to have to pray tonight for Jesus to give us something to eat or we won't have breakfast tomorrow. And she looked down at Lily's feet and saw her worn out shoes and she said, and we need to pray that Jesus will send us some money so we can buy you a new pair of shoes. So they prayed and asked Jesus to give them some food and give them some money for Lily's shoes. The next morning they got up and Mrs. Stead went to open the door and it didn't open quite right. She pushed a little harder and heard a scraping sound and turned around and there was a box filled with groceries. And in the box an envelope with $10 or so, just enough money to buy Lily a pair of shoes. Mrs. Stead made breakfast. But before she went out shopping to buy the shoes, she sat down at her table and she wrote these words. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Over grace to trust him more. They went out and bought the shoes. And Lily put them on and went out to play in the yard. And Mrs. Stead sat down again and watched as Lily played. And she picked up that piece of paper and she continued to write, I'm so glad I learned to trust Him. Precious Jesus, save your friend, and I know that Thou art with me. Will be with me till the end. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? 